Well, uh, first of all, I want to say many thanks to you, um, Sophie, and to Louise as well, um, and to everybody else um, at the museum. Well, thank you for that introduction, and obviously thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. It's wonderful to see so many people here, at least, you know, sort of see virtually, um, especially at this time when, of course, sadly, it's impossible for us to, to go and enjoy the Royal Worcester collections in the galleries and uh, for many of us to, to go to museums um, at all. So without further ado, I'm going to dive straight in. As my primary aim this evening is to give you an overview of the research that um, I've done at the Museum of Royal Worcester, exploring those links between the ceramics produced in Worcester over its whole 250 year history, those connections with the many artistic traditions which comprise the so-called, often called Islamic arts. I'm going to talk for around half an hour, um, or at least aim to keep it at that length because we want to have plenty of time for you to all get your questions in and we can have um, a bit more of a discussion afterwards. So first of all, I um, have started with here a rather eclectic um, collection of images to start to just give you an idea about some of the material that we're going to cover, as I think it really demonstrates the richness uh, and variety of the collections now held in the museum. But I also feel to a certain extent when I was putting this together that I was thinking about the range of you uh, out there because I feel like the audience today will also be um, a bit eclectic. I know that um, some of you will know a lot about the English ceramic tradition, the production of porcelain in, in England, probably quite possibly more than I do, um, but perhaps you'll know a bit less about the, um, the arts which have come out of the Islamic cultures. But of course, vice versa, there'll be others of you who are coming from the Islamic art traditions and may know a little bit less about the Worcester context. So with this in mind, I just want to start with two introductory notes. Um, first, for those of you who are less familiar with uh, Royal Worcester, I want to emphasize that um, historically, it was one of the most prestigious manufactories of, uh, of porcelain in England. It was established in the 1750s, so early on in the, in the history of, of porcelain production in England and it was granted a royal warrant shortly afterwards. But something that I didn't know um, before I first arrived um, to the museum uh, about production in Worcester is that it took place in a number of factories which fall under the Royal Worcester umbrella. And in the 19th century, which is where a lot of what I will talk today uh, happened, um, two of the most prominent were Flight and Bar and Chamberlain. So um, you might hear me mention them again. For those of you who are less familiar with the other side uh, of tonight's subject, the Islamic context, I wanted to spend a moment just to consider this label of Islamic, as I think it actually is somewhat, it's an imperfect term in this context. Yes, the field in which uh, I, I work, research, um, is widely known as Islamic art. But you'll probably notice that in the case of the objects which I'm going to discuss this evening, you'll see relatively little that has anything to do with Islam. And I do have to admit that this is a matter which our field is constantly and um, somewhat solipsistically uh, grappling with. And I could again, I could give a whole lecture uh, on this subject. But the most important thing that I just wanted to highlight from the get go is to emphasize that these places and cultures which you know stretch from Morocco to India and but beyond um, should not and, and cannot be defined solely by a very narrow reading of this one term Islamic and I hope that actually some of the pieces that I will discuss over the course of, of the next half an hour um, will help to show how diverse those traditions were within these regions. But to return now to these images, uh, which are on your screen, this slide is what's speaking to the diversity of uh, the collections within the uh, Museum of Royal Worcester. And it points to some of the material that we're going to look at now. 
So um, from the selection I've just pulled up here, I um, want to just explain that this shows that um, there are objects themselves, of course, represented here by this wonderful um, portrait miniature uh, at the center bottom of your screen and by this rather vibrantly colored vessel uh, in the top right hand corner. But all of this is accompanied by material which is really in many ways equally valuable, which is archival material, such as photographs, um, which you've got down the bottom right hand uh, corner, and also original sketches. And this is an original sketch, which I particularly like, uh, dated 1916, but it's actually adopting a, a design which was incredibly popular on, on tiles and other vessels coming from 19th century Iran. Um, and then accompanying all of this, um, we have the wide design library from the Royal Porcelain Works, uh, also now housed at the museum, which I've represented here by, um, by the open book you can see here in the center of the screen. And I'm going to ask you to bear that vessel in mind, this wonderful hybrid vessel with a porcelain, with a ceramic body, I should say, and its metal fittings. And I have to say uh, further on the portrait miniature that um, for those of you who do know me um, or my work, you may be surprised to hear that I'm not going to talk um, about this little portrait miniature um, because it does depict uh, one of the Shahs of Iran, Fat Ali Shah, who, um, as Sophie said, uh, is the focus of my PhD research. But um, I am actually still, I'm working on this. Um, I'm working further on it and the other ceramics, which the Shah and the court at the time commissioned from the English porcelain manufactories, including Worcester, um, but also Royal Crown Derby and Wedgwood. And I'll actually be talking about that research. Um, I hope this isn't too naughty, I'm doing a little plug. I'll be talking about my research on that um, in a separate talk for um, a wonderful online seminar series called the New Directions in 18th and 19th century art seminar. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, be ha I'll happily share that. Anyone can get in touch with me if they want to come to that. So more work is happening on that portrait miniature, but I'm not going to talk about it this evening. So to continue with this evening's theme, I want to take you into the museum for a moment. Sophie's kind of already taken us there with her, her Zoom background. Um, but I want to go there just for a minute to think about the space and the place that, you know, this, this is actually all about, but unfortunately, um, you know, we can't be there. And what you're seeing here um, is, well, there were a number of outcomes of the time that I spent doing the research at the museum, including the all important nitty gritty additions and um, adjustments to the catalogues. But I was particularly thrilled to be able to put together a display which charted the stories which I identified among all the fascinating material which I was able to sift through. And with the help uh, from the team at the museum and their designers and printers and all these other people, we were able to show off some of the less well-known stories uh, which really come through um, through production at Worcester. And as you can see here from these little glimpses, I, I did, I sort of also obviously want to show this as, you know, the display has somewhat been a, um, it's been a victim of lockdown. And um, unfortunately not that many people have had the chance to see it. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of what it looks like. Um, but you'll see that emphasizing again, the importance of all this other material, something I really wanted to do was place the objects beside the archival and design material which really gives us a much deeper understanding of the processes and moments of collaboration and creativity, which were really behind, uh, behind these examples of production. So from the display, and this evening I'm going to focus on, on two objects, which uh, to try and stop myself from talking about everything, two objects which are representative of the wider trends and themes and narratives which really sprung out at us during the time which I spent at Royal Worcester uh, and which I then explored in the display. So these two pieces also reflect the different tracks along which the research was running which Sophie has also just um, mentioned. 
So the first is that I was very glad um, to be at the museum as part of the Islamic Subject Specialist Network uh, and specifically their calligraphy program, which helps more local museums to read and understand objects with um, Islamic, let's say, often Arabic and Persian inscriptions on them. And this track is kind of represented by this plate that you can see on the left here. The second track was that supported by the Expert Eye programme run by West Midlands Museum Development, which allowed me, afforded me some extra time to think about these themes and the points of connection in design between Worcester and uh, areas of, um, of the Islamic world. Uh, and that's represent represented by the second piece here. However, these two pieces do something else as well because they exemplify the two main trends which I found running through uh, the material held at Worcester and its relationship uh, on a more international on a more global level. So on the one hand, throughout their history, the porcelain factories at Worcester have made many services and other sorts of pieces for the ruling elites of countries such as Egypt, Iran, India, uh, and places in the Gulf such as Qatar. These pieces often display a really distinctive combination of styles and shapes, which we would expect from English porcelain on the one hand, with the creative addition of, of motifs and marks, which really sing, sort of signal the destination and consumption points of these pieces. And that's represented by the plates on the left. On the other hand, artists and designers at Royal Worcester drew inspiration from the Islamic arts and incorporated motifs and shapes from Persian, Turkish and Arab and Indian uh, traditions into their work. And that's represented by, by the vase. So we're going to start with the plate first. I'm actually just going to take the porter. I've already done my bout of online teaching today, so I'm trying to not, not get too hoarse. So we're going to start with the plate. This is a plate from uh, a service made in Worcester for Azam Jar, the Nawab of the Carnatic, which is a region in southern India. And it would have been produced around 1820. Um, the whole, the service was vast and, and took a good three years to produce. So it will be somewhere between 1820 and 1823. So the order for the service was placed in Madras through a British import export firm and did, it was vast, it comprised over a thousand pieces, all made of soft paste porcelain. And this included dinner wares, dessert wares and a breakfast service. And the piece with which we're concerned here is likely to have been part of the breakfast service owing uh, to the pink of its relief uh, molded border with gilding. I think in the past, I did read um, one source that suggested that the pink was made for Azan Jar's wife, but I, I, I think that, I, I don't think that is true. So this is the breakfast, this is from the breakfast service. Um, the dinner service, um, which is here exemplified by two pieces now in the v &A, has the dark blue border uh, rim. And as you can see here, each item in the dinner service also bore the depiction of a different botanical specimen. And these were from irises to lilies um, and all sorts of things, myriad flowers that I have um, never even heard of. They were all taken from depictions from Curtis's botanical magazine, which was an incredibly uh, popular publication in Britain at the time. So design wise, we can see that these, this service is very much fulfilling our expectations of what an early 19th century uh, English service would look like. But the pieces are embellished in another way. And that's where the calligraphy comes in. As you can see here on the rim is the inscription which tells us who these pieces were made for and, and when they were made. So this is an Arabic script on, on the, the rim here. It reads Amir al-Hind Nawab Azam Jar Bahadur and the date uh, is given in the Islamic calendar of 1236, which is equivalent to 1820. And I'd argue that the placing of this inscription 
in a shield shaped cartouche on the rim recalls the placing of a family's arms or other symbol on what are commonly known as armorial wares. So while the Nawabs of the Carnatic didn't have a crest in the usual European style, they could use their name uh, and title to represent themselves in exactly the same way that a crest can also be used to personalize an object. And just to go back to that breakfast plate, of course, the same mark of ownership can be seen in the center of the plate here. This combination of a distinctly Perso-Islamic form of identification and ownership, um, I should explain that this sort of inscription would be very commonly seen on a coin or perhaps on a seal that would be used um, to mark ownership. Um, it can, this, 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 this seal, in a way, combined with a very English style of early 19th century porcelain, highlights some of the most significant aspects uh, of the shared history of Britain and India at this time. So just before this service uh, was ordered in Madras, the East India Company had recently annexed the region of the Carnatic following the Carnatic Wars. And the rulers of the Carnatic were um, deeply in debt to the company. Interestingly, the company itself had also, in fact, recently ordered its own vast dinner service from Chamberlain, who, who was the specific factory that created this order, this service. So I think, therefore, that this service, of course, with all the creativity that went into it and the collaboration that would have had to happen getting this inscription to Worcester, um, everything that went into the fusing of these two traditions also stands testament to the colonial history of Britain and India and really exemplifies and in some ways symbolizes part of the control which the company then had over the region, militarily, politically, but it shows that the influence they had extended right as far as the dinner table as well. This kind of service, however, obviously was not by no means the only order of this kind that Worcester has ever received. And the tradition of orders um, for ruling elites in the Arab world, particularly in the Gulf, uh, as well as in Iran and India, this continued really right up to uh, until production stops uh, in Worcester in the 20th century. With this example here, um, as is evident from the palm and the crossed sword and that distinctive green flag, which you can see uh, the rider bearing on the left there. This service was made in Worcester for a Saudi Arabian client, most likely to have been a member of the government um, or the royal family. And there are many more, many, many more examples of services such as these produced mainly in the second half of the 20th century possibly reflecting that boom in wealth and prosperity in the Gulf states from that, the huge income from sources of oil at that time. But perhaps equally, this surge in production for customers further afield also reflects the waning of, of this fashion at home and the desire for these services um, closer to home. So moving on now to our second case study of the evening. How am I doing for time? Good. Um, this is a vase around um, nine inches tall, made of what is known as a glazed parian ware, because so-called because of this, um, this beautifully white uh, color that it has. And this would have been produced sometime after our plate. Uh, this would have been produced between 1877 and 1890. And as you can see, the body of the vase has been meticulously, delicately pierced to produce this wonderful floral vegetal pattern across its surface. I think many of us are very used to seeing what we think of as Chinese or Japanese style patterns and motifs on ceramics. And Royal Worcester is well known for its production of chinoiserie and uh, you know, the likes of Imari wares. However, there was also a period when the factories were busy producing large amounts of so-called Persian wares. We might think more readily of the tiles and dishes produced by uh, William de Morgan, which displayed these sort of quintessentially Islamic motifs and used the technique of lustre ware, 
uh, of luster glaze, which was first uh, which was first used in 10th century Iraq and was later taken to its heights in 13th and 14th century Iran. But Royal Worcester also participated widely in this 19th century moment of persophilia. Here is the vase again now in the company of some of the other pieces produced in this style from this range uh, and which are still in the museum today and which I included in my uh, in the display. And one of the things that I think is amazing about these is you can see them, but the first time I handled them, I wasn't really prepared for how light they would be, but at the same time, actually how sturdy they are. I mean, they're, they're, it's absolutely incredible, the work that, that went into these. But this is a moment uh, where I want to turn and really draw on the archive that the museum holds. Um, because when I arrived at the museum, I had no idea um, about the wealth of material that it held alongside the actual objects. Um, and obviously, you know, as exciting as it is to work with objects, uh, I found um, the archive actually to be incredibly productive. And here uh, I'm just giving you a couple of examples again of the type of material which is available from um, photographs here of the, the stunning reticulated wares. And on the left is just one of what must be thousands and thousands of designs in um, the pattern books. And I just wanted to show you this one because I um, I love it. I mean, you know, it's it's wonderful and, and colorful and, but also speaks to that adoption of certain here in this case, kind of Indo-Persian um, designs and motifs with that wonderful um, swirling, swirling paisley motif on the rim. But as well as the archive, what I'm also going to draw on is the design library, which is a collection of, um, hundreds of publications once used in the Royal Porcelain Works, which uh, the works were used by the designers working at the various factories um, to inform their designs. And I was really excited um, to find a number of works in the library that include samples of designs from Arab, Persian, Turkish and Indian contexts. These three plates are found in Albert Racine's L'Ornement Polychrome, which was published between 1869 and 1873. This work is very much in the tradition of Owen Jones's earlier 1850s grammar of ornament, providing a really vibrant smorgasbord of snippets of all sorts of artistic traditions from across the world. And this really demonstrates the fact that this was an era which was very much preoccupied with the cultivation of good design. Here we can see, I've just chosen three from the many plates. Um, three plates on the left, we've got Indo-Persian, in the middle, we've got Arab, and on the right, we've got Persian. But it's important to recognize, of course, that this selection and collection of motifs was not free from the bias of the compiler uh, or from the prevalent tastes of the society and all its norms of design. Um, and other strongly held beliefs um, which surrounded him. And also it's got to be mentioned that at this time, good design was very closely linked to the idea of, of a good, good society. So from these specific um, examples that I've chosen here, I'm more interested in the, in the Arab and the, and the Persian examples we can deduce that um, Arabs were perhaps known for their production of metalwork because here and um, there are other Arab plates um, in in the in the work, but but there's definitely a focus on on the production of metalwork. While the Persian tradition was particularly herald heralded for its um, book illumination, um, and these seem to be the two the two main themes which are really picked up on here. But there's also something small that I wanted to draw your attention to, which is also the presence of inscriptions. Um, and particularly on the Persian, um, the Persian plate, you might be able to see a small rectangle in the center, which contains an inscription. So while L'Ornement Polychrome provides designs from diverse places, uh, other works such as um, Emile Puis d'Avennes La Déclaration Arabe, focuses purely on the arts of, uh, of the Arab world, and in this case, largely Egypt, actually. 
Uh, and as you can see here again, he includes metalwork, um, but he also includes ceramics, uh, designs in stucco, textiles, and, and many more media. But again, I've chosen this one because I, I think that this plate um, exemplifies two of the principles of, of design, uh, which were seen as being a hallmark of, in this case, Arab production. One is the presence of, of the inscription. A large inscription takes up the, the, the upper image here. And at the bottom, we see a thick decorative uh, theme, a, you know, a profusion of, of what is commonly known as, as arabesque. So with all this in mind, returning to our vase, sometimes, uh, if we're lucky, it's possible to draw very direct comparisons between objects depicted in these works held in the design library and pieces produced at Worcester. This metal bottle was published in an 1873 work, bearing in mind that the vase would have been produced between 1877 and 1890. This was published in 1873 uh, in a work by Edouard Lièvre, which was entitled Works of Art in the Collections of England, um, sort of mapping the, the star objects of the day. And this is a 16th century brass bottle from Iran, then in the collection of John Henderson. Again, this is exactly the type of work that aim to inform the wider public and indeed designers about um, these sort of star objects good taste and what was collectible at the time. And judging by the presence of this object in this publication, which only features very few objects actually, all things Persian were obviously very much in fashion at the time. And this trend is really borne out by the range of Persian wares, which were produced in Worcester in the 1880s. In the center here, we can see, I hope you'll now sort of be honed in to this, this shape, this, um, this distinctly Persian shape as our, as our parian ware, pierced parian ware, um, but with a different surface decoration. And actually this is very typical of, of, well, I mean, of ceramic production everywhere, but you know, you see a lot of mixing and matching uh, amongst these wares in terms of marrying shape with, with surface decoration. Um, I hope also that you'll remember that vessel, which I pointed out to you from the, on the book in our, on, on my first slide, um, because I wanted to match it up with this um, piece from the Worcester production, which um, is, is, is mimicking that porcelain uh, sort of ceramic body with, with metalwork. And actually many of these pieces are, are imitating um, metalwork. Uh, and again here, I mean, I could go on, there are, there's actually, um, there's a remarkable a number of them, some more loosely Persian and some more, more exuberant than others. Um, but a point um, that's quite common across a lot of these, which I want to draw your attention to, is the fact that some of these pieces even bear attempts at imitating those calligraphic inscriptions which are found on the original object and which I just drew your attention to in the design books. So here, and I've, I've circled it to, to, help you, um, to help you pick that up, we can see these distinctive pairs of, of uprights which are actually mimicking the rhythms of an Arabic inscription. However, here, the sort of the eye familiar with um, an Arabic inscription will see that the letters are actually slanting the opposite way to the way we'd expect them. So here you can see they're sort of slanting to the right, whereas if this were Arabic or even, um, even just an inscription on an original object mimicking Arabic, which sometimes is the case, it would be more slanted to the left. And I think that this is quite possibly evidence of what is quite literally lost in the translation of, of designs, as it's quite possible that a trace uh, of an image of an original object might have been flipped and then copied onto a design for this piece. And I just want to show you a couple more, show you some of these more um, in detail. I hope it's obviously these are old photographs, but I hope you can. Um, see here in the center we have what I have to admit actually is a much um, freer interpretation of what an Arabic inscription might look like but still it's signaling the presence of inscriptions there and here 
actually we have a much uh, a much more concerted attempt at producing the effect of a, of a longer inscription. So I just want to pause now, I've given you these few examples um, for a moment to consider why these inscriptions or attempts at inscriptions were included on this production in 1880s Worcester. We'd normally think that in, an inscription uh, would convey information or be decorative. Um, I think in this case, I mean, it's not conveying any information. I'd say, yes, it is adding to the decorative aspects of the piece. But what I would argue is that these, this is the designers at Worcester signaling something that they see as being quintessentially Persian or quintessentially Islamic, um, as we've really seen these two hallmarks of what was conceived of as Islamic design being the presence of calligraphy, the presence of calligraphic inscriptions, and the presence of these decorative motifs, um, often referred to as, as arabesque. But in our exploration of the Persian vase, I want to sort of wrap up with this object um, and just to have a closer look at this, um, which to a certain extent I feel beautifully exemplifies the really wild eclectic style of, um, of the 1880s. Um, it's incredibly exuberant with this very bulbous shape and these, these wings that it has. Um, and, but I want to just focus in on the, the decoration on the body because for me, this is, this is difficult to read. You know, I look at, a, there are many pieces like this in Worcester, I look at it and I think, oh, is this Persian? Is this chinoiserie? Um, because there is so much going on here and I can see echoes of the chinoiserie, I can see echoes of the Indo-Persian. Um, however, if we look more closely at the label, we can see that it has been designated still as Persian style. Um, and now I'm happy to stand corrected, um, but I would argue that there is very little about this object which says strictly Persian. Uh, in fact, there's, there's almost nothing that makes this object Persian, except perhaps um, this sort of distantly pot-bellied shape of the vessel. So this begs the question as to why it's described as Persian style. I also just want to add a note on these wings because they actually, um, they appear quite a lot in this, uh, in this, in this sort of range. Um, and I just wanted to show you this publication of Henry Wallace's work, The Oriental Influence on the ceramic art of the Italian Renaissance, which is also in the Worcester Design Library. And we can see that the distinctive wings on the vase may well find their roots in the very fashionable so-called Alhambra vases, uh, which were much copied in the 19th century. I'll note that this publication is actually from 1900, so it won't have served as direct uh, inspiration for the vase we're just looking at. Um, but it, it just indicates how popular the style was around the late 19th century. And actually, it was quite nice when um, I actually had to ask Louise to send me a photograph this yesterday, and I noticed that it had lots of grubby fingerprints on it. So I feel like you can see that these, these books really were handled by the designers uh, once in the Royal Porcelain Works. Um, so we're still left asking, why is this vase described as Persian? The short answer is because Persian sells. This is a late 19th century England where the lyrical verses of Edward Fitzgerald's version of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam was to be seen on the shelves of every self-respecting middle, upper middle and upper class house. The Shah of Iran uh, at the time, Nasir Adin, had taken London by storm uh, on his visit in uh, 1873, when he was very much the talk of the town. And of course, the v &A had recently opened its Persian court in the 1870s, filled with hundreds of objects from the thousands which its agent in Tehran had, had shipped to London. And these are just, just a few examples uh, of, of the prevalence of, of, of all things Persian at this time in England. Persia was a byword for romance and, and, and style. And this desire for all things Persian also had its root uh, in, in another belief, which was prevalent in Europe at the time, which saw Persia or Iran as a sophisticated progressive place 
as sometimes opposed to what was perceived as the backward nature of uh, the Arab, predominantly Arab countries, which of course this was based on a now completely discredited racial theory which opposed Aryans, uh, the Aryans of, of Persia, the perceived Aryans of Persia, uh, against the, opposed them against the, the Semites um, represented by the Arabs. So it was often assumed that any good design must come from Persia. And I'm, I must caveat this, of course, by saying that uh, there were, of course, um, examples of of Arab design being drawn on, being drawn, being drawn on, and and Arab being used in a in a in a positive way. And the first example, of course, that comes to mind is um, we have to look to Leighton House uh, and Lord Leighton's Arab Pool. But I would say that more than Arab, Persian became an indicator. Um, denoting a very commodified Eastern elegance in the late 19th century. So while I might have just said that this vase has nothing to do with Persia, in many ways it was Persian, but that was very much within a framework of a conceptualization of Persian, which had been formed completely in the minds of the European milieu which created it and within which this vase was produced and consumed and the other many other vases um, that were in the range which accompanied it, including um, our vase which I started off with. So to return to our object, I should wrap up because um, I have gone off longer than I wanted to. I hope um, that now that you've heard these these two stories um, and the wider histories behind these two objects, um, you can see them in a different way. <clears throat> the one takes the English ceramic tradition um, to India, but very much within the, the context of the colonial uh, milieu of the time. The other bringing hints, let's say, of Persia into English porcelain, but again, very much within, within the, the, the perspective of, of the European mind and its understanding of what Persian design was at this time. But I also hope that this talk might have helped you to see Royal Worcester uh, and English porcelain more generally, and indeed the Museum of Royal Worcester collections uh, in general in a different light. Uh, just as these objects can speak individually, speak to deeper histories and help us to understand um, global histories, so too can the museum do that more widely. And I think that, you know, there's often a bit of misplaced snobbery and dismissal of our local museums, which I think is such a shame, not to mention them being undervalued uh, when it comes to funding often. I, I have learned so much from the time that I spent researching at the museum in Worcester, whether that was about Worcester or England or Iran or India um, or the United Arab Emirates. Um, so I really just wanted to end by encouraging you to visit the museum of Royal Worcester, even if my display is not still there, uh, once all the museums open their doors to us again. Um, and if you can't go to Worcester, go and see another local museum and um, support it because these are really valuable institutions which need all the help that they can get right now. And you never know what local, but also global stories you might find out about.